So the wonder drugs, uh, well, we have a list of them uh, here. The brutinib and adalalisib have been approved. The obinutuzumab, uh, that, the new antibody that Dr. Halleck spoke about, and the ABT199, and none of them are free of challenges. That doesn't mean that they're problems. Uh, they, they just have to be handled. But about 5% of the patients with the brutinib will develop a, a new atrial fibrillation. And uh, the, uh, the reflex there is to anticoagulate the patients, but unfortunately, uh, ibrutinib is associated with platelet dysfunction, so that you have a coagulation of the malady and a platelet dysfunction, which is a bit of a challenge, and the patients still develop a Richter's transformation. Sometimes, idolalacib patients have GI problems and some pulmonary infiltrates, and even the ABT199. Uh, the major cause of uh, failure of that regimen is the development of various forms of Richter's transformation. So as mentioned, Ibrutinib came along and was approved for a, uh, a variety of uh, studies, and it inhibits a, uh, the particular enzyme BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And Bruton described this uh, defect in young boys, uh, that they had a mutation in the gene so they couldn't make this BTK enzyme, and they couldn't make any B cells, and they couldn't make any gamma globulin. And ibrutinib was designed to inhibit the active site of that particular enzyme. And it's proven to be remarkably effective. Uh, the, um, uh, the protein to the left of it, the PI3 kinase delta, is inhibited by idolalacib. So, um, it's a very effective inhibitor of this when it gets in there and it tightly binds. But as mentioned, if you have a mutation in uh, the gene, you can mess up the binding site so it's not as tightly bound, and that's one mechanism of, re of resistance, but it's not the only mechanism. So we're still learning how to most effectively give this drug and the most effective dose. As also mentioned, uh, the absolute lymphocyte count will often go up quite uh, dramatically from 20,000 here up to about 65,000 and then gradually go down over a period of time. And over in the right, you will see these uh, big chunky areas of, uh, of uh, lymph nodes in the, uh, the front or the upper part of the curve in the armpits and in the lower one a couple of months later, they've all disappeared. So the most impressive thing is how rapidly the, uh, the lymph glands go. And there's a lot of diversity in how long these uh, cells circulate. And it's related to a degree with the fish test, the genetics. The trisomy 12s go up quite promptly, and a week later they go down. And the 13 Qs will hang around for around about 12 to 18 months. So again, we're just learning how to handle this. But the impressive thing is how many patients respond. So as you can see, even in the first clinical trial, and in a phase one, two clinical trial, to get a response rate of 80-something percent was almost unheard of. The investigators thought that. The uh, independent response committee was a bit tougher and dropped it down to 65 percent. But these patients were when we we're still learning how to use the drug and uh, the response rate really is over about 80% for almost everyone. And the top curve in the blue is if you give the drug as initial therapy, and there's only one patient who failed, a patient of Dr. O'Brien's who developed the Richter's transformation, so that uh, it appears to give very long control as a single agent when given frontline. If they're relapsed in refractory, uh, that is, they've had a number of other treatments before or have uh, had a response and, uh, and then the disease has come back in the, uh, the yellow curve, there is a drift down, which is, again, related uh, largely to the 17P group of patients. See, one of the um, uh, problems that we have is that many of the clinical trials that lead to approval are d designed uh, by the companies in conjunction with the regulatory agencies. And the regulatory agency says, we will approve your drug if you test it against this. And uh, what they tested it against was an intravenous antibody uh, called ofatumumab or Azera. Uh, and that this was the Resonate study. 
And the progression-free survival was obviously the end point and dramatically in favor of the, uh, of the, uh, um, of the abrutinib in that top curve. The survival didn't show a, uh, a dramatic difference, uh, but it was a significant difference. And again, uh, most of the, uh, the fall off in survival that went from the top curve down to the bottom curve occurred within around about uh, three to seven months. And that was because there was clumsiness in the crossover from the antibody when patients were failed to get onto the drug that we knew was better. Uh, but we had to go through the motions. But as you can see, these patients have continued to do very, very well. Now, when people say, well, uh, this uh, chromosome 17, everyone does badly. Well, that's not actually true. Uh, you can see that in our experience with the whole range of uh, ibrutinib studies, uh, we presented this at the American Society of Hematology last year, and the green curve of the, uh, the 17P group of patients, and the others are the 11Qs and the others, and there are no real difference. So the 11s do fine, but the 17Ps have not done very well. But one of the things is that uh, we also looked at whether there was a lot of damage to the chromosomes on uh, any of the patients going on study, and those that had the most damage, that is a complex carrier type, with a group that did very badly. And the problem is that most of the uh, 17Ps have a lot of DNA damage, and that's the group that doesn't do well. The 17Ps, if they don't have DNA damage, do as well as everyone else. So we've gone away from doing conventional cytogenetics uh, on the marrows uh, because it wasn't terribly helpful initially, uh, but now we think that we can identify a lot better uh, the group of the 17Ps that's actually going to do better. So we can draw a number of conclusions about the abrutinib. It's very good in decreasing the total amount of, uh, of CLL because the CLL cells that are circulating in the bloodstream are only about 2% of the total amount of CLL. The rest of them are in the, the bone marrow, the spleen, the lymph glands, etc. And because they shrink so dramatically, you dramatically decrease the total amount of, uh, of CLL. I've already mentioned the 17P improvement. It is very, very uncommon to get to the point where you can't find any CLL cells. So they, there's always this family of cells that's left behind, and the target for us now is to get rid of that and I think the most effective way to get rid of it is going to be uh, teaching the patient's immune system uh, to be able uh, uh, to accomplish that. There was a, um, uh, the study of idololacib uh, was uh, uh, rituximab alone versus rituximab and idololacib. I hated that study, refused to uh, put any patients on because I knew that the control arm was ineffective. And it was proven to be ineffective because the red curve is how quickly they responded. And uh, there was a survival advantage because we couldn't salvage them uh, quickly enough uh, with the idololacib. And unfortunately, we have to use idololacib and rituximab. As, uh, as uh, Dr. Johnson said, every time you add rituximab to a regimen, you add another $50,000. Uh, so, do we have to uh, add it to every regimen just because the FDA tells us to? Uh, well, I don't think we do. I think uh, Michael's already gone through the obinutuzumab and shown how effective it is uh, that you can get if you use chloramicil and rituximab on the left versus uh, what they call GA101 or obinutuzumab uh, with the chloramicil, a very significant difference and a, a significant prolongation of progression-free survival. As uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned, progression-free survival means the time from when you start until you get a response and then it begins to regrow. So that uh, we're convinced as well that the obinutuzumab is the best of the antibodies that uh, attacks the target of rituximab called CD20, which is on the surface of the uh, CLL cells. And again, uh, to get to the point where you can't find any 
remaining leukemic cells, this antibody is better at doing that than the, uh, uh, than the ibrutinib does. So it's more effective in, in clearing it. So if you can't get access to ibrutinib, uh, there are a number of antibodies that might be available to carry you along until we can develop things uh, such as that. The other study that was alluded to that's just been published in Lancet was the chloramicil versus chloramicil and the other anti-CD20 antibody called ofatumumab or Arzera. And it had a very similar outcome to the GA101 with a prolongation of the, um, uh, the outcome compared to chloramicil alone. The missing arm here, however, is ofatumumab by itself. So ofatumumab by itself would be better than chloramicil, but do we know that chloramicil actually adds anything? It's an alkylating agent, it's oral, it's cheap, so the regulatory agencies love it. However, it does damage DNA. It does cause second cancers. So uh, it would have been nice if that had a, a third arm that just looked at the antibody to prove that chloramicil didn't do any bad things. Uh, because I'm not sure that did very many good things. So the standard, the watch and wait. I would encourage you to be uh, grateful that you're in the watch and wait group, uh, because by and large, they have a pretty good quality of life. It's not a good thing to have the, uh, the ticking, uh, saying I've still got this disease, but I would encourage you to be uh, patient, as Michael said, because I think in the next uh, couple of years, uh, we'll be able to figure out how to make that go away. So when we uh, start to look at uh, things, the young fit group of patients that's now been established, I think, quite clearly, FCR better than BR, uh, BR better than uh, fludarabine and uh, rituximab, and uh, now the question is what we do next. Now this uh, drug, ABT199, um, uh, for example, if, you, uh, if you're treating patients uh, with ibrutinib and you're left with a reasonable number of cells left behind, what you have is a mixture of uh, CLL cells and normal B lymphocytes. The normal B cell lives on average seven days. The average CLL cell will live 100 days. And it's kept alive by these survival proteins such as BCL2. And what happens with the ABT199 is that it blocks this survival uh, family of cells so that at the present time, what we have to do is to put patients in hospital. We give them a 20 milligram tablet and, uh, and tell them to read the newspaper. Uh, every couple of hours, we check their blood to make sure the cells are not dissolving too quickly to be dangerous. And then the next day, they leave the hospital. Their white count's gone down by 50%. The lymph glands have shrunk by about 30 to 50 percent, and then we gradually escalate it uh, to what we think is a reasonable target dose of 200 to 400 milligram per day. And as you can see here, it achieves complete response. To have a complete response means that you have to normalize the bone marrow as well so that it's more effective in, in doing that than anything that we've seen before, even some of the 17P group and those that are refractory. The other thing is that uh, ibrutinib is not terribly effective in getting rid of the bone marrow infiltrate. And in the waterfall plot that you see on the left, the bone marrow infiltrate uh, has more than a 50% reduction at, uh, after about six months of treatment in about 90% of patients. And true, complete eradication of the disease occurs uh, in a reasonable number of patients. So the question is, what's the best thing to combine with the brutinib or combine with the ABT? And one of the things that uh, Dr. Gandhi has been doing is that because the ibrutinib-treated uh, patients have circulating cells, you can take cells that have already been exposed to ibrutinib and test it by adding other agents. And there are only two agents that Dr. Gandhi has been found to be very effective in increasing the killing of those cells, an ABT199, which is now called Venetoclax, V-E-N-E-T-O, 
C-L-A-X. And you can remember that because uh, Veneto is the wine producing area around Venice. And uh, so it's very close to my heart. The other is a drug called carfilzomib, which is very, very effective in uh, interfering with the NF-kappa B pathway, which is involved in a lot of different cancers. And it's an oral medication that's very effective in multiple myeloma. One of the things that you've heard a lot about is these chimeric antigen T cells. Now the T cells are the cells that identify foreign cancer cells and want to get rid of them. The other family of cells is natural killer cells. A chimera is a mixture of two genetic subsets. So what you do is that you take the T cells and then you incubate them with either a virus or electroporate them and uh, shift a genetic sequence in that then gets into the genetic makeup of, this, uh, of the uh, patient's immune cells. And then you expand them up a thousand fold, taking them from 100 million to 100 billion cells over a period of about uh, three to four weeks. And then you give them back to the patient. The patient has developed a receptor which attaches to the leukemic cell, blows holes in them after a couple of weeks, and a number of patients can have very sustained, that is three to four plus year uh, remissions free of recurrence of the disease. So it's doing what a stem cell transplant does with uh, much less toxicity. And uh, there are a whole bunch of areas that are being looked at now, a number of pharmaceutical companies that uh, are getting into the mix. The other is a uh, group of drugs that are called the checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, this is the T cell there, and then there's dendritic cells and tumor cells and uh, macrophages uh, that Dr. Um, Halleck uh, alluded to. And there is this tremendous dialogue that goes on between the microenvironment and the tumor cell uh, in the lymph glands and other places. And all of them have these stimulating molecules and neutralizing molecules. There is a, uh, a, a guy who's now working at our place, Dr. Allison, who's going to win the Nobel Prize uh, because he figured out how to unlock the T cells so that they can attack the cancer cell. And ipilimumab has now been approved and it's taken the long-term survival of uh, extensive malignant melanoma from 3% to 20%. When you add uh, nevolumab, uh, the PD-1 antibody that's also approved, and do the two together, it takes it to 35%. And for the first time now, we have access to this uh, group of drugs so that we have four protocols around. And I'm certain that we'll be able to activate the T cells to kill off the CLL cells in a reasonable number of patients and potentially eradicate the clone. So these are the, uh, the group of, uh, of antibodies that we're going to be looking at. Uh, I, will, I just mentioned uh, earlier that if anyone wants to get a copy of the slides, I'm happy for anyone that wants to waste their time going through them to get a copy of the slides. Some of the academics that don't have anything else to do during their life uh, might want them, but as patients, I wouldn't bother. So the situation's now very easy. Uh, years ago, uh, in the uh, 70s and early 80s, we had chlorambucil plus or minus prednisone. It's like going to a fancy restaurant and you can say, I'll have a hamburger or a cheeseburger, and that was all that was on the menu. But now look at what's uh, happening. These are all different target areas, chemoimmunotherapy, different antibodies, the inhibitors of the signal transduction, the microenvironment the inhibitors of uh, signaling pathways, aberrant uh, CD53, apoptosis pathways, T cell, etc. So if you think it's difficult deciding uh, what to buy your mother for Mother's Day or your, uh, your wife for Valentine's Day, think of how damn hard it is for us to figure out uh, how to combine all these drugs and uh, get the resources to do the clinical trials to do it.